Welcome to the John Campia Podcast, episode number 26 for Monday, June the 27th, 2016. Hey there, guys, and thanks for joining me for this episode of the John Campia Podcast. Really thrilled to be joined today by Collider's own Christian Harloff and Wendy Lee. We're going to be talking about that incredible Game of Thrones finale last night. We're going to talk about some of our favorite stuff on television of all time, talking about the struggles that Independence Day resurgence is having at the box office and a whole bunch more. So sit back, relax. The John Campia Podcast starts right now. Well, hey guys, and thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. I am so excited. This is going to be my first podcast where I'm joined by two people. Uh, one has been here on this before, and uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new guy that you've probably never heard of. First of all, uh, joining us once again on the John Campy Podcast is Wendy Lee. Wendy, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, John. Hey, guys. And uh, this up-and-comer in the YouTube space, uh, Christian Harloff. Hey, how's it going, guys? <laughs> Who's this guy? Oh, I don't know. I just found my way up here from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's community service or something like yeah, that. Thanks for having me on. So we got a whole bunch of things we're going to talk about today, mostly focused on TV. And then uh, as per normal, I'm going to go over to you guys. Uh, you guys left all the topics and comments you want us to talk about on the Facebook page. Uh, I put that up about 20 minutes ago and there's 160 responses on there. So we will get through every single one of them. Uh, no, we're not. So, <laughs> but uh, I mean, we got to, we got to start off with Game of Thrones, right? Oh. I could not be here last night. To, because for those of you who don't know, here at the uh, Clyder offices, there is like a watch party, uh, a Game of Thrones watch party every Sunday night, which is always great and a lot of fun. However, Anne and I were off in San Diego celebrating our anniversary, so we were not here. This is, I'll say this, this is the first time maybe in 10 years that I watched an episode of television twice in the same night. Wow. Because we watched it on HBO Go at 6 like o'clock. Right away, right after. Yeah, yeah, so we're in, we're in our room. And we watch it on our laptop first at six o'clock. So we didn't want to wait till nine. Mm -hmm. And then we watch it. We freak out. We go for dinner and whatever. It's like, let's go back to the hotel room and actually watch it on HBO on the TV now. And then we went back (laughs) and we watched it again. But um, anyway, I was blown away. No pun intended there, huh? No pun intended. (laughs) I was blown away. I am not even the biggest Game of Thrones fan. I mean, I like the show. I've always liked the show. I've watched every episode, and it's a good show, and I enjoy it. But the last two episodes have been something freaky, and I guess we can talk a little bit about uh, Bastard versus Bastard last week, a little bit later, but I mean, this was absolutely incredible. It was the strongest, this is going to sound weird, to me it was the strongest finish to a weak season of television (laughs) I think I've, I didn't even think this was all that good of a season what? on oh, Game of Thrones. Last season too. I, no, and I did. I did. I didn't think last season was all that good, and then it finished strong. Mm-hmm. And I, I wasn't all that into. It had some strong episodes, but overall, until episode seven, I guess I was thinking, eh, this is kind of a, just a throwaway episode. And then it finished so strong. Uh, but that's it, where I'd argue a little bit, though. I say that because I think the reason it's finished so strong is because you were so invested from those seven episodes that they put the way that they tied together the story from episode one of the season leading up to. And were, there were a little thing like even the drag out for is Jon Snow alive or dead? They answered that right away in episode one of the season. But as you yeah. start to pick up through those seven episodes that you're talking about, too. You're starting. It's almost like the show uh, with with Bloodline in season one, right? Where the first six episodes are a little kind of like, all right, what's happening? And you realize I needed all those episodes. I needed everything to happen inside there because now I care so much because I'm so invested now. Because essentially, the last episode was just a big, fun, great battle, but. It doesn't have. It doesn't carry the same weight if you're not so invested from the from the lead up of Jon Snow coming back, from Sansa and Jon getting back together, from the from the fact that you see uh, Rickard Snow get get captured. Like all these things that are happening in these little moments of the maybe throwaway episodes are essentially not really throwaway episodes because once those seven and eight, uh, excuse me, nine and ten hit, which I agree with you, are some of the two best episodes in television mm-hmm. history. But the way that they kind of back to back does not happen often. For me, those little episodes enriched my experience. Wendy, I, I remember you and I were texting each other last, last night. night and you hadn't seen it yet. I hadn't seen it. I was hanging out with my in-laws so and they don't have HBO and they're not into the show at all. So I was like, well, I'll just watch it the next day. And then when you asked me to be on the podcast, 
I was like, well, I better go home. So the plan was me coming in here this morning and watching it after movie talk. I couldn't wait. I couldn't log onto my Facebook, Twitter, whatever, just without like, spoiling for myself. So I stayed up until one in the morning and I watched it. And oh my God, the first 20 <laughs> minutes just had me just, I covered my mouth. I was screaming. I was yelling. I don't know what I was doing. It was very intense. Yeah, it, it was. It was nuts. And I remember we're sitting there watching it and it's like, okay, what is Cersei going to do? Like, his, she's not just going to go and stand trial. We knew that. Like, Anne and I were in right. the case. She's not just going to walk in there and stand trial. I thought she's going to kill a few of the Sparrow Guards, and the the uh, the mountain is going to get her out of there, and she was going to get out of Dodge, or she had some kind of legal trip trick up her sleeve, or something like that. Or I started <laughs> thinking, because uh, once – who's the, the king's wife again? What's her name? Uh, Mar- Marjorie? Marjorie. Marjorie. Yeah. When they kind of – tipped their hand that Marjorie wasn't as into the whole High Sparrow thing as she right. was letting on. And I was starting to suspect maybe her and Tommen are both in on something here and they're going to pull a fast one and Cersei's going to... And then we sat there and as they went down into the catacombs, oh. I remember going, I said out loud and I gasped when I said, I went, they're pulling a Godfather. <laughs> and Anne went... She goes, she goes, what do you mean? Because she's, she's seen Godfather. Right, but she right, hasn't watched it obsessively right. like I have. I said, the Corleones are calling all family accounts I- into account right now. She goes, the Corleones? What? What are you talking about? I said, just watch. Michael's about to settle all family accounts right now. She still didn't quite understand what it yeah. was talking because she saw the Godfather like two or three years ago. And sure enough, she pulls a Godfather <laughs> and yeah. kills like and, – and they shot it like the Godfather. I was losing mm. my mind because they go to um, – not the uh, not the septum. The um, uh, who's the learned guy? Uh, what do they call him again? Maester. They oh, go yeah. to the Grand Maester. Him getting wiped out. They go to Cersei's cousin. Him getting wiped by out. The kids, well, the too. Grand Maester, oh, by the way, uh, aka uh, Donovan from Indiana Jones, Jones, aka Empire Strikes Back. He, uh, I, I was still trying to figure out why he, why they took him out. Like they took him out because he's. Was he as invested with the high? No, Sparrow? no, but he tur- he turned against Cersei. I know he did. I know that's why. So I, this I mean, was Cersei he, calling into account. You know what this was? This is Cersei becoming Palpatine. And I'm surprised because I, I agree with all the Godfather stuff. But you look at it; she's got Vader, aka the artist formerly known as the Mountain. Yeah. I mean, she's got that. Guy, I mean, that's when I knew that it was going down. Was when um, the Mountain walks in, stop and the says king to from the leaving. king. Don't yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, then, that's then, when that I knew means something was up. Yeah, I mean, everyone's everyone's toast. And then I like that they called back the explosives from Blackwater. Mm-hmm. And that's where they had all that stuff. And the question is how they got all those barrels there. We'll, we'll figure that out some other time. Um, but it just, when that went down, and like you mentioned with Marjorie, when she was when she said, no, 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 I've dealt with Cersei before. She's not here. She knows, that was my favorite line. It's like, she knows, she the, knows consequences. the consequences, and yet she's still not here. Let's get out of here. And, and they wouldn't let her go. Her. No, and then because that was the arrogance of the High Sparrow. Yes. And you saw, like, at the very last minute, he realized it, but it was too late. And the graphic explosion, I mean, look. The, the, what, Him blowing up. What, what wow. HBO is able to do, though, man. And the fact that, like, yeah. you remember, like, th- this is unheard of five, six years ago that Absolutely. a television show to do this. Like, how cinematic it is. And, the, like, this is on sci-fi six years ago. It looks ridiculous. And we're laughing about this today. But it looked, it, this looks as good as anything, even better than most things you see in film. So it was the way that all that was executed in the first 22 or 24 minutes, whatever mm-hmm. it was. And then the king jumps off the, the balcony. Oh. And did like, not, I didn't see that coming. I saw it once. I, I didn't see it at first, but when they held on the shot, yes, I'm like, oh, he's out the window. Happened. You know what I thought yeah. he was going to do? I, I thought, because remember, he had just taken the crown off, right? And then he walks out and they held on the window. And my first thought was, he's going to, you're going to hear his footsteps. He's going to walk up and when he's just going to chuck his crown out. Like he's like oh. in disgust. I didn't see him. I didn't him. think he was going to come back and hop onto the ledge and just yeah. like free dive and, into the. And, and have a King's Landing. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, the reason I thought he was taking that dive is because if you look at it, everything he was fighting for, that he because remember, he thought, because Joffrey was the one that was supposed to be in power, he was, he was always battling of what he yeah. was supposed to do, what was his purpose. Mm-hmm. And he finally finds his purpose, whether or not we agree with his purpose or not, that he's going for, for the, the religion, for the High Sparrow. And, and he loved his wife. His wife. And he loved his yes. wife. So, and, and he was trying to do everything, and he, and he basically, he told his mother that the, he, he, he made amendments to the rules that have been there forever because this was his path and like that his mother took his path away from him he had nothing else so out the window he goes yeah i, I was i was stunned yeah. i mean yeah. i was absolutely stunned that moment but it was so powerful and the music, music oh. during that whole thing and and the the 
the editing choices of when to come back to Cersei and yeah. her looking just staring out the window and then back out and watching the Grand Maester dying and then back to Cersei smiling and oh my god shame 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 oh that oh, scene with the uh, nun that, oh man but she man it, it's like it's part of it it's like it, it was so torn because Part of me is going is saying, "Oh, this poor lady." The other part's going, "You know what? You deserved it." You know? it's like, <laughs> she had yeah. it I know, I know. Like she, she was. It was this kind of highfalutin look she had the whole entire time. And even when Cersei was saying the things like, "Like you know, you enjoyed it." Watch me. I'm going, "Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah, she did." And I'm like, <laughs> but then at the same time, terrifying. And then when we finally see Sir Gregor come in, but it's, oh but that's what I'm talking about the Vader thing. Like he takes it off, and you yeah. see, it's like it's like you see the the burnt skull. And um, but when he when he goes in there, just that that rot and the fact that Cersei had so much enjoyment and that she was mocking her with shame shame shame, shame. shame at the end you're just like oh man this is it's, it's the emperor lady. it's the emperor you know, okay so I wrote this on my social media this morning tell me if I'm alone I wrote am I is it bad that there's a little part of me last night that was kind of cheering Cersei on because uh. because remember what they set up with her in the season finale last year they they took one of the most unsympathetic characters in this show and they made you go yeah. Hey, that's, and, and think about this. Okay, think about this. And I know it's horrible to say poor Cersei. But think about mm-hmm. this. Between what she went through last season with that, first of all, being imprisoned, being beaten, all that kind of stuff, then having to do that walk of shame. Mm-hmm. She's which lost she three knew. children. And on top that's, of that. That's where I yeah. sympathize. Her yeah. whole yeah. world was her three kids. I mean, sometimes watching the show, you could almost rationalize or justify some of the things she's done. Not because you agree with it, but because... Ultimately, she's doing this for her kids, and what mother wouldn't do with the most they can for the kids? And now her kids are gone, right. and now she's sitting on the Iron Throne with no anchor to her humanity anymore. Right. And man, we, I had some people tweeting me last night saying when she was walking down up to the Iron Throne, mm-hmm. people said, "I could just hear the Imperial March." Yeah, yeah. yeah. People, yeah. Was, she was yep. she's the Emperor because you look at there's she is completely turned to the dark side, if you will, because yeah. there's nothing there. Like she has, she used to have some. There were, there were always consequences of what could happen to her kids and protecting her kids. Now there's nothing. Now it's just yeah. get out of my way and whoever's coming, let's go. Let's go for it. There are definitely people coming now, um, but she's but it, she has nothing to lose anymore. She doesn't have her father telling her not to do something. She can keep her brother lover at uh, at bay. Um, and, she, and who doesn't want that? Right. I mean, really. she, yeah. She's the one. She's the she now is calling all the shots there. And God help. All of yeah, that, that's a scary thing to see, to see her sitting in that throne, just that satisfaction she had. And, and it really, going back to your question, John, it, I'm torn because ha- part of me sometimes as a woman and as like just seeing her, what she's gone through, I'm like, yeah, I kind of do feel bad for her. And then she turns around, she blows up the Red Keep, and I'm like, no, screw her. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, first of all, with the satisfaction of seeing her blow up the High Sparrow and the Septims and, yeah. and, and the, the Guard and all that kind of stuff, Marjorie was in there. Yeah. And then I guess in her mind, like I remember I was she talking to somebody. hated Marjorie. Yes. Oh, of course she hated yeah. Marjorie. There was a time when they were sharing the suffering and th- there was a time when maybe Cersei might have done something for Marjorie and vice versa. Well, she but- tried this season. She tried the season to make a deal and try to like to, you know. Yep. But it just, there was just so much power that the High Sparrow had that this was the way she had to do it. So even to her, even though she didn't like it, she's like, well, even Marjorie could help in a certain way. It's going to cause some strife for me down the line. Collateral damage. I'm gonna. This was her power move. This was the move for her to capture the Iron Throne. She did it. She did everything she could. She made all the moves throughout the. And that's what I, I going back to the point before of everything she did from the end of season five through the first six or seven episodes here in season six. These were all the moves that ultimately led to this big grand decision. That you know, part of me is with Wendy, where you're saying, "Oh, you know, this woman is just pure evil." But then you start to say, "Well." The things that she went through, and this this was her move. She was backed against the wall. It was either stand there, get the the emblem in your head, and and that's not. We yeah, knew she wasn't going to do that. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't happen. So it's like, okay, I'm going to either try this move. It's going to work, and I'm going to sit in the throne. And at the time, my son will rule because that's what she was thinking. Um, now, had she taken out her son also? Then, yeah. then that's but that that's why I think they stayed true to the character. She yes. wouldn't have done that. Nope, no, she wouldn't she have would done not, that. She would she die before. Yep. No matter what her son did to her, she would die yeah. before she mm-hmm. let anything right. happen to her son. And I thought that was really interesting. One of the highlight moments to me in the episode last night that I, I'm not hearing a lot of people talk about 
but I absolutely loved was in the throne room in Marine when Danny and uh, Tyrion, uh, Tyrion oh, have this their scene. conversation because you think about Tyrion and everything he has seen and been through. Like he's grown up, his idea of rulers is his father and you know the Mad King, and then Robert, who wasn't all that great of a king, even if he was a little bit more noble, and then his nephew, and then you know, and all this stuff. And he gives a speech about I've given up on believing in anything, but. And I heard some people criticize when he says, but I believe in you. Because, oh, it's too quick. And it's like, no, no, it's not too quick. Think about what he's seen her do. She has risked her life. She has sacrificed right. to free slaves, to be just. And then even when she wanted to wipe out slave masters, Tyrion says to her, let me suggest another way. And she actually shows restraint and mercy. And, like, I'm sitting there going, this is somebody Tyrion would follow. Totally. And I've never seen anybody in this, other than maybe his brother, I've never seen anybody in this show that would... I would believably go, I can see Tyrion following this person. Well, that's exactly it, is that he, he tells her, he gives her the advice. She gave him a shot in the first place where she could have taken him out. Yes. She gives him a shot, and she listens to him. And the, the and last she makes ep- him the hand. And the last episode, though, to where he said, like you said, listen to me, hear me out, she does. And then he watches that plan that he came up with be executed, and it worked out. And now here, that's a position that they're in. He knows. And remember, this whole entire episode was about redemption, whether it was Cersei, whether it was the, the North, Whatever it was, and this was about this Tyrion is also going to get redemption. King's Landing. Who else has a big beef with Cersei? Tyrion, and yeah. he's gonna. He, and, and now he's got a pretty big hand to play once he goes there. And if, but what a lot of people I didn't think picked up on was when he was talking to Danny about the fact that she had just basically said to Dario, "You can't come with me," right, and yeah. then he how much in lo- love he was with her. And she didn't really feel it, and he told he told her, "This is not the first time a man has fallen in love with you, and it won't, it won't be the be last. last." And then look, it's almost like he fell under the spell for a second. I Go back and watch that no, scene yeah, yeah, totally for true. a second. He was, and he just kind of like shook it off for a second. But it's happened so many different times, you know, Sir Davos, or I mean, not Sir Davos. Um, I know you're, yeah, yeah uh, uh, Jar, Jar, uh, yes, uh, that uh, guy, yes, got the stone skin disease. friend zone, uh, friend zone, Captain, <laughs> yeah, friend zone. Captain friend zone, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so all of that, that scene I thought was crucial to ultimately where we're going to go in next season because they're still playing the short game, even though they think they're playing the long game. They think that King's Landing is the, yeah. the long John game. Snow's the only John guy Snow is the only the one playing the long game. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite moment, Wendy, of, of the episode last night? That's a tough one to call. because It is so a many- tough one. I would probably say The King in the North. That was my favorite, too. I'm so glad yeah. you brought that because that that, to me... Remember I said this started totally with the Godfather influence. The mm-hmm. King of the North scene to me was the kissing of the ring scene. Yeah. That, that, that whole King of the North, it was like they followed, I felt like they were following this metaphor of the Godfather mm-hmm. all the way through, and I loved it. But this, what is uh, Lady Mer, it starts with an M. Oh, um, the, the, Mer- the girl, right? Mermont? Mer- Mermont. Mermont. Yeah. Lady Mermont. She's so good. Um, somebody, I put this up on my Facebook today. Somebody sent me this picture. It's, it's Lady <laughs> Mermont sitting in her like ruling chair for her house, and it said, if this girl had three dragons, this show would have been done three seasons. Yeah, ago. Yeah, she's <laughs> and, great. and then somebody else sent me this great picture of it's the 300 poster, but they Photoshop her in instead of 300 it says 62, <laughs> which was just awesome. This little girl, when she gives her speech, she, she goes, gets nominated. I know he's he's yeah. a bastard, but he's the only king of the north. He's my king, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then everybody else st- stands up and starts doing their thing. And it's like, oh my God, this is awesome. It's so funny you mentioned that because when that scene happened, the first thing in my head, it was a little thought, but I was like, well, wow, would this guy listen to this girl, this young girl? And I'm like, after that speech, you damn right yeah. he would have. Yeah. And then, like, she that, shamed them all. She crushed that speech. And because when she was, as she started to give her speech, I'm going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, she, because it, she made such great points. Like, everyone else who had sworn allegiance to the Starks over the years, no, I'm yeah, good. You no refused thanks. the call. No, thanks. And she did it. Even, and they, even it was the limited amount of soldiers she was able to commit. She's committed everything because she believed in the cause and saw the end game. Because the North remembers. Yes. And all of that was so great and I, it was also my favorite moment because of the it, it brought me back to Rob Stark I felt a little sad yeah, that yeah. Too, yeah. the king of the north again. I haven't heard that chant in so long and when that chant came back the thing that really bothers me though and I know it's going to come back yep. is Sansa yeah, little finger. Man, like the little finger just kind of sitting back in the background, just plotting kind of already, s- plotting, and then looking over. And he's already been inside of Sansa's head, um, and he's he's got those thoughts in there. And you could see her. It's like the smile when when she's supposed. But she's always if you go back to season one. 
granted, she's grown up a lot since season one. Oh, yeah. But yeah. she was always about prestige. She was always about mm-hmm. the power. Um, and that might be creeping up a little bit here. Now, before we, we move on to the next topic, it would be remiss if we didn't mention Arya. Oh man. oh man! And how, like I gotta tell you, man, I, th- there were parts of me seeing uh, Lord Frey dying in some huge battle, or like some, some people storming his his great room, and I don't know that I could have been more satisfied. Yes, like when she lifts up the top of the pie and there's a toe. Yeah, <laughs> she's oh, but they're here. It's like oh my god, she's feeding his sons to him. I just I, I was it was very subtle. It was very it was very quiet. It was just one person and one other person in mm-hmm. a room. But I felt really sad. I don't know. Do you think? Did you think they were new somewhere grand? Or like for me, like I said, I felt completely satisfied by it. I, I didn't. I wasn't really sure what was happening. I noticed, the, you know, this bar girl, and she keeps on looking at uh, Jamie when he was, you know, at the now bar. we like, know why. Who is this? <laughs> yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. The best way to do it, it's just so satisfying when she slit his throat. It's the same thing that he did to her mother. It was yeah. perfect. It was just sweet justice in the best way because now he's going to be searching for his cat back in the Harry Potter ca- castle because he, he fra- <laughs> phrased toast. Um, it was great that he was – I love the actor. I think he's an amazing actor. But it was time for him to go and the conversations that he was having with Jamie right beforehand about how he just always kind of sat back and just watched everything happen and the way he fought battles. He didn't have to pick up the sword. Well, he didn't have a chance to pick it up this time because yep. – and it was mm-hmm. this was, again, like we mentioned with Redemption, it was a stark – episode stars coming back to power and i mentioned this in in our game of thrones review is that i always thought from like after the red wedding that the starks were almost like the kennedys but if you go back because of all the tragedy the lannisters really are because i mean the, the yeah. starks, starks have lost a couple lannisters are starting to drop like flies yeah. for the most part and they're broken up and the union is just not there anymore they're not as strong as they used to be so to watch the stars kind of come because even bran bran had a pretty strong episode too yeah. without him we don't get the big reveal that i'm sure we're gonna yep. talk about in a second mm-hmm. here but uh like bran and then sansa obviously had a good episode last one and this one even though we don't know what's going inside her head new king of the north there's so much of the starks are doing now and then Arya, of course evoking revenge finally yeah. and she, yes. she'll probably rejoin the family here I'm guessing so. pretty Bran, quickly think, too. yeah and Bran well Bran he's right d- there he's there yeah. yeah he's already he's come home right basically and of course the reveal of that that I mean something that most people have suspected for a long time he's not really Ned Stark's son well Bran sorry no um, uh, uh, John Snow John, John yeah John's right, not right. really his son um, that so a, a lie he Ned even perpetuated to his wife right that he would rather have his wife think he cheated on her and had a son somewhere else which obviously that I mean he's a Targaryen right yes and I have- and knowing that if, if Robert found out that Jon Snow was mm-hmm. a Targaryen he would have killed yes. he would have yeah. killed him that's yeah. why well if you see the one thing that you can actually pick up when his sister says to him is promise me you'll protect him yes that's what she says promise yeah. me you'll protect him then she whispers right so I, man, you talk about getting hit in the comment section today on, my, on our uh, Game of Thrones review. I put it in there that I thought that I thought that um, he was the Mad King's son. I thought the Mad King. It's he, either that or the Mad King, King's son's grandson, son. Grandson, apparently. Yeah. yeah. So like, so Danny's brother, apparently. Yeah. But I'm kind of hoping so it was the Mad King. brother or is a nephew? I've also read nephew. I think, I think it was brother. I, I still believe there's a chance that it's actually that the Mad King himself did it. That's what I That's what I think. And I kind of hope. Well, the one thing with that, Because he's either Danny's nephew or Danny's brother, I think. Now, but the thing is, if he is the Mad King's son, if he is, then he's the heir to the throne. Yes. Then he's heir. He, then Cersei is sitting in his seat. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. Now, if it's. And when Daenerys him, shows up. The what happens? Chairs. Well, yeah. But but it's all. But then the if she if she, if he is indeed Daenerys's nephew, mm-hmm. then Daenerys can still make a, make a claim, claim to the, the throne. throne. Mm-hmm. Yeah. it's very interesting. Jon Snow doesn't seem like a guy that's going to want to take that throne again because he's playing the long game. It's about the Great War. I can almost see him going, "Look, fine, okay, I'm going to help you out. Whether or not you're my aunt or my sister, whatever the hell you are, go sit in the throne, get mm-hmm. your dragons, and then let's go fight the wa- White Walkers. Yes. That's going to happen. I think the battle's going to come to taking out Cersei first, capturing the throne, and then fighting against the Walker. Where do you see this coming? I agree with Christian. That's exactly my my thoughts. Yesterday is I don't John John Snow. I mean, he's even a little bit hesitant when uh, when you saw his face when they were kneeling down to him and calling him King of the North. You know, he had this like I don't, I'm not sure if I really want it and. And I, I agree with you. I think he's seen the White Walkers. He knows what they can do, and that's his number one priority. And here's here's something interesting to keep in mind too. The only person who can declare a Snow a bastard and give them an actual family name is 
the, the the Lord, right? So whether that's the king or the Lord. So only Lord Bolton could say Ramsey was no longer Ramsey Snow. You're right. Ramsey Borden. Right. Bolton. John can now pronounce himself John Stark. He's the king of the north. He can actually take on the Stark name, thinking he is, and then will Bran reveal the st- truth of them? I don't know. So right. much cool stuff. And we'll go with that. Bran is rightfully... The, the the heir to the, the north, heir to the north, yep. because he is the last living male uh, Stark of Eddard. Yep, uh, or of Ned. Excuse me. So that's going to be so much, so much <laughs> cool stuff. We could talk about this for another hour, but I want to move on to something else, a little bit related. So last night I watch it, and I and I think about it for a little bit after I watch it because I was just blown away. Again, Game of Thrones, not my favorite show, but and I got on Twitter and I said, I believe this is the single greatest season finale of any television show of any oh. season ever. And I just put that out there as my, my own thing. And I, I struggle and I struggle to think what season finale, not series finale, not season, but season finale, did I like better? I mean, the um, the one Breaking Bad. Uh, yeah. Mm. Did, did they call it? What was the name of that episode? The Ozymandias? No, was that it? wasn't that. Ozymandias. Oh, that, was, was, that was something that was, else. Was yes. Hank. Um, but I remember the, the one where, where Gus Frank. Gus, I don't know if people seen Gus, Breaking Bad. Yeah, so I but know. I mean, yeah. so there was that one that came close. So that got me thinking about television as a whole. So I want to put a question to you guys. I'm going to tell you what my favorites were. It got me thinking about what is my favorite show of all time? Mm-hmm. What is my favorite single season of all time? What is my single favorite episode of any television show of all time? What is my favorite series finale? And my favorite season finale. So season finale... I, I just kind of tip my hand. It, to me, it was Game of Thrones, The Winds of Winter. I don't think I've ever seen a, a season finale like that. So it's just for me, my all-time favorite television show. And stuff because there's a few I really love, but I'm going to go with the Ronald Moore Battlestar Galactica. I just, I, I just, I, no, no TV show before that had ever wrapped me up in it as much as that did. My favorite single season of television, Heroes Season 1. That was my sing- my favorite single season. That that season was just perfection to me. It starts off with the nuclear blast, and then it ends off finally with Siler and Peter uh, confronting each other. A little bit of a weak ending to the season, actually, but still overall my favorite season. My favorite single episode of television, Exodus Part 2 from Battlestar Galactica. My favorite series finale, All Good Things from Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, that was just like a perfect ending to that show. And then, of course, my favorite season finale would be uh, Game of Thrones, uh, The Winds of Winter. So that's where I am on those issues. So, Wendy, I didn't give you guys advanced warning yeah. about this. That was coming. So, Wendy, let me start with you. Let's start with your favorite television show of all time. What would you say oh, is man. your favorite TV show of all time? I would – It's a, I'm, a, I'm a Joss Whedon girl. So I would say it's a pretty even uh, match between Buffy or Firefly. Oh, I love Firefly. Yeah. What about you? For favorite uh, series of favorite all time? series of all time. I'm probably going to give Breaking Bad the edge over the wire just just by that much. Game of Thrones is getting up there though. It's in it's in my top five for sure. But I would put I put Breaking Bad I think consistently as a series just never let me down. And I was always there was one particular episode which was the Fly episode Ryan Johnson. And even then I've gone I back and love I was, that I was episode. Say, even going and then I've gone back to revisit it and it's genius. It was such a so change it, of gears it made, for the show. So that to me I think. Overall, as a whole, it's harder to find a more a perfect series in my eyes than Breaking Bad was. Okay, so then let's move on to uh, the next part of the question. What would you say is your favorite single season of television out of any show? Favorite it's funny because my favorite show is actually Battlestar Galactica, but a different show had my favorite single season. So what about uh, you guys? I'm going to give you Dexter season four. Oh, with oh. John Lithgow. John Lithgow. Yeah. Dexter, that's a good one. That Dexter was a great season, season four to me because... Up until I, if that season didn't happen, I probably would have given you uh, Sopranos season two. Yeah, that um, was great. But mm-hmm. season four of Dexter, even though the ending of that season ultimately, I think, um, no pun intended, killed the rest of the series. <laughs> um, I think that it was uh, it was just on the edge of your seat every single episode leading up to one of the most tragic episodes yes, in, yeah. in series history. Uh, yeah, there's a Dexter season four. That's a great pick. Anyway, That's Wendy, a good one. What about you? Uh, I kind of have to agree with you on the Heroes season one there. Yeah. It's, that's, that's a pretty good one. I feel like I want some more Which time only highlights how downhill that show went after that. Oh, oh man. Because I, I, I was so in love with that show. I mean, I think if that was able to deliver just one or two more seasons equivalent to season one, that might have been my favorite TV show of all time. Yeah. But it went so downhill so immediately. And I remember 
they went downhill. And then after season two, I actually got together with Milo Ventimiglia, who played Peter Petrelli. And we were talking about season three. And he talked about the writer's strike, which the writer's strike did hurt season two. But they just realized we thought we needed to repeat some things that worked in season one and not realizing, no, we need to move on from those things. He goes, but trust me, he said to me, season three is our love letter and apology letter for season two. We're going to make up for season two of season three. And season three was even worse. Yeah. Uh, but they tried. I mean, they tried new things. So yeah. I give them that. They but... even tried to reboot it recently, too. And I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that was awful. I watched one yeah. episode and I fell off of it. I love that they brought back, uh, I can't remember the character's name, but the, the horn-rimmed glasses guy who was the, the cheerleader's, no, who was the oh. cheerleader's dad. He, oh. Claire's dad. Oh, Claire's okay. dad. Who, he had no powers. I, and I love that character. I thought, if you're going to reboot this thing and have one character remaining that you kind of build it around, I thought that would be the right guy, but I, I watched about three or four episodes, and it was like, oh, this is just terrible. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't watch any more of that. Okay, what about favorite single episode Ever? of television? Ever? Yes, There's a lot. Oh man. What, what would be some of the ones that would just jump to mind quickly? I mean, uh, I'll give you. I mean, I think from from Daredevil recent season two, it was mm-hmm. pretty damn good. Was oh, that whole punch. episode three or is that episode? Yeah, I mean, two? there were a couple, but the one that stood out was that when he, I don't want to spoil it, but it's just basically when it, it was a Punisher episode where was that with him in the cemetery. It was in the cemetery or in the on cemetery the roof? episode because yes. both of those both of them were really were good. Great, so I'd, the cemetery I'd give, one was I'd great. Give that one, I'd also give uh, season two of of Sopranos when they when they finally find Big Puss and right. they confront them on the boat. That was a pretty good episode. Um, I mean, there's so many. Was that two or three? That was two. That was two. Three, three was Jackie. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, then that season, that series, to me, I, I still love it, but I think that it, it had a Tay Day from seasons one through three. Um, other episodes, I think that you know the, the Osmondius that you had said before with yeah. um, with Breaking Bad is one. The Gus Fring one is one. Yeah, there's so many great episodes in TV. What kind, which episodes jump into your mind of ones that you really loved? Bad of the Bastards, uh, just because it's fresh in my memory. It's yeah. one of the best ones. And oh, then yeah. going back to Buffy, the Gentleman episode. Oh my god, that one! That is didn't, like, it, didn't it win an Emmy? Or I didn't like even. That? I'm not even a Buffy fan. Some, yeah. I'm one of these few people that I didn't like Buffy, but I loved Angel. So I, I don't. I know, right? You usually you either like both or you dislike both. I really loved Angel. I didn't like Buffy, but out of I didn't like Buffy, mm-hmm. but that episode stands out to me. When I think of Buffy, that's the episode. Yeah, my I buddy Camden Toys in it. He's uh, one of the gentlemen. Oh, oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's so cool. I would also say the pilot for Battlestar Galactica because I was also oh, a big fan yeah. of Battlestar Galactica. But like for me. That was the one that made me say because people were telling me about that show, and I went to what like that is it was the, the what what happens to begin with Trisha Helfer and the baby and like all these things that had happened at the very beginning of that I didn't know a show on sci fi would take those kind of risks and it shows you the tone and what you're in for immediately when you watch that pilot. All right, let's move on. Uh, oh, I, I forgot one more thing. One oh. more thing. Your favorite series finale. Final episode. Seinfeld. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, w- I still remember that because I was at this big viewing party for the final episode of Seinfeld. I remember at the end of it was like a lot of us looking at each other at the end of Independence Day Resurgence. We were all just sitting there looking around each other like, what was that? Yeah. How do you end this show like that? But you know what? A lot of the best shows have had bad... Look at Dexter, too. The that's final episode of Dexter was terrible. That's and- why I'm picking Breaking Bad again because to me... Breaking Bad, I, I was so nervous going into Breaking Bad series finale because th- what you just described, I am always let down by series finales. Like the last season of Dexter was atrocious, and I was so bad. I was, a, a, again, no pun intended, a diehard fan <laughs> of Dexter, and I bailed. I still haven't seen the last four episodes of the, of the season. I just watched the series finale, and it was so stupid. I was this is atrocious. Breaking Bad from that ride you're on and that entire thing of where yeah. Walt's going and then how it ultimately ends makes sense for everything he's done on his journey and with the music and song at the end. I was completely satisfied with that series finale. Yeah. Uh, Any favorite. stand out to you? Uh, I mean, you guys gave some really good examples, but you know, I was thinking of series finales is what we're talking about. You know, I was just so disappointed. I know, and I know I'm going the opposite direction from one of my favorite shows, Castle. It is the probably the worst season finale ever. It's oh, just no, like really? series, series series finale. Series. Just just like try to wrap it up because they had to tape two different endings because if they had to continue without uh, uh, Kadex Tana, it was the female lead. They were going right. to let her go, so they shot two different endings: one with her, one without her coming back. And obviously, the show was ended. And it's just like so convenient. Everything was so convenient for you know procedural show to have this like suspense of. De- 
suspense of disbelief or yeah, whatever. Suspense of it's disbelief. just like terrible. And I, I went from loving the show to this entire season. I was like, this was such crap. I'm kind of, I'm glad it's over. Be done with. I still you know what's know funny. Nathan Whenever anybody will think of Nathan Fillion, they will think Firefly. But how many seasons? Oh, his man. his most his biggest success in his career was Castle. How many seasons did that go? Seven, seven or eight. Seven or eight seasons. I mean, like that's just nuts. Yeah. And, and so, but when people think of Nathan Fillion, they will yeah. instantly think what was of yours? series finale. Yeah. Uh, all good things. Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh, okay. yeah. That that epi- that finale and it was a two part series finale. It it, it jumped. For those of you who don't remember, it, it jumped into the future a bit where Picard was now a retired admiral. But Q gets involved, and there's they're needing to, they need to hopscotch through three different periods of time, past, present, and future, to prevent like time itself from collapsing or whatever. Now that sounds really far flung, but the way that the episode is run and done, remember this series, Star Trek: The Next Generation, started with Q, and it ends with Q, which was great, and the title was perfect. Because right. I can't remember how many seasons that show was, seven or eight seasons as well, but the title of the series was All Good Things, and I don't think I've ever seen a series wrap up so perfectly, and 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 yet not give the, the sense that, oh, but this world is now done because the story's done. No, 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 the world continues, and this universe goes on, but this story of these people is now wrapped up, and it was just so, so bloody good. Um, a couple things we should touch on just briefly here. So the box office comes out. Uh, this weekend and you know first of all big surprise for me the shallows make 16 million if you had asked me that a month ago i thought maybe the shells might have made four or five. Oh, really yeah oh, i really i did not see any interest for that hmm. but it basically makes back its budget on its first week so congratulations to that free state of jones whatever i hated that movie oh. um independence day i mean i'm sure a lot of people have already talked about what they thought free of state of jones day. is actually not number five anymore it got pumped out what? yes it's number six yeah, yeah it got pumped out what yeah. about get pumped out um, conjuring two conjuring two pushed oh, it back. It, because nice. it looked like the original numbers were that it looked like it was going to be number five and then beat it by 120 thousand. yeah all right conjuring <laughs> Conjuring 2, Conjuring 2 hanging in there in its third week. It's now like Conjuring 2. What is it? There was a budget of $40 million for the Conjuring 2, and worldwide it's made $242 wow. million. <laughs> um, Independence Day, though, nothing. Now, we're not, I'm not going to sit here and bash on Independence Day again. We've already done that enough. But if you had told me four months ago the new Independence Day was coming out and it was going to make under $100 million, I would have had a hard time believing that. I, I mm-hmm. did, it, never in my mildest dreams I think it would be a two hundred million or one hundred seventy five million or anything like that. But I thought it could sleep at the wheel and make a hundred million opening weekend. Word of mouth got out fast, man. Made a hundred, made forty one million bucks. Well, I think they they hurt themselves by not screening it for the for the critics because it certainly was a very bad movie. I didn't, but there are some people out there who are enjoying and thought it was that kind of fun, dumb stuff. And some of the critics I got to see it overseas wind up liking it. Mm-hmm. I think that they should have taken the shot and released it on that Monday or Tuesday to get maybe those those types of reviews that came out overseas and got them here to create some kind of buzz because they, they didn't do that. It came out on Friday and it just, it yeah, it just underperformed. Were you surprised or did, did this come in right where you thought it I'm was going to I'm surprised that in? it came in even, I, I know it's low, but I'm surprised it even came in at number two. I just thought it was going to have a higher number than 41. Especially, I mean, with, sorry, finding, I, especially with finding uh, Dory yeah. being in its second week. Yeah. yeah. Like, like if you had told me, okay, will you know, uh, Independence Day beat Finding Dory, Independence Day will have its first opening week, and Dory will be in its week too. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, yeah, that'll beat Dory. It didn't come close. Yeah, see, I... I didn't think it was going to beat Dory because of the number that Dory hit the first week. When it, it was hit, just cr- 134 million. When it hit, when, when it 134, wow. 140, whatever it was, I said, there's no way it's going to have that big of a drop. We're looking at between 65 and 70 million. And it got around that range. And because of the uh, lack, bu- lack of buzz for Independence Day, I thought maybe between 40 and 45. But the one that surprised me was Central Intelligence. Central Intelligence yeah. pulling in 17 or 18 million on its second week. Not bad. When you had these two big releases and only dropped. I think 45% or whatever it did. That to me is the impressive one out of all the bunch because The Shallows had the highest rated as far as reviews go out of mm-hmm. the new releases that just opened. But to me, for the fact that Central Intelligence could hold off in its second week and do that, and I said it today on Movie Talk, I think shows more that The Rock is a guy that can draw in um, box office. Mm-hmm. Kevin Hart has drawn in some, but he's also had some few flops. Right now, The the, the Rock is a draw. Yeah, yeah he might be the only legit box Tom office Cruise. draw out there. He's, he's had a he's couple. He's had a couple that, you know, I, I don't, I think he's back Tom Cruise. on it though now. He's back yeah, on it. I don't know that people are running out to see Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise movies 
just because Tom Cruise is in it. I think, you know, he's got his big franchise, his Mission Impossible franchise Jack going Reacher. really great. Yeah. Um, it took – people didn't jump on board with – uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. It took a while for people to hear that that movie was awesome, catch sure, on to sure. it. But The Rock, it's like you can, it almost feels like you. I feel like you could put him in the Tooth Fairy 4. And then they, and they, open I think it just came out that they are. I actually, a good, a good buddy of Dennis and I is actually the editor on Tooth Fairy 4. So but it's, it's a direct to video thing. Yeah. But I seriously, I think you put The Rock in that, and I think it makes $20 million open. That's why he's in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the other thing about The Rock. A friend of mine we were talking about the, the, the other day about, like, why is he, he's, he's risking overexposing himself? Why is he doing so much? It's like, because he's brilliant. Look, The Rock's big thing right now is part of his charm, and he's improved vastly as an actor over the past seven years, absolutely. But he knows his thing, he is this monstrous, big, charismatic, lovable guy. But he's in, he's approaching 50. He's getting, he's approaching his 50s. Um, I'm gonna, I got to look up exactly how old. Can you look up? What? Can you look up? Think well, he, yeah, he's in his forties. He's, he's, he's early forties. Yeah. Is he early? Can yeah. you look up how old The Rock is, Wendy? I'm, I'm pretty sure he's like forty. He 43. knows that that he's only he's there's an hourglass running on how long he can do that. So why not do as many of those roles as you can? It says that he's why, 44. He's 44. Born. Okay, so he's in his, he's in his mid 40s. He just turned 44. Yeah. So he's in his mid 40s. So there's only so long you can do that. He can't do this for 20 more years, you know? So I think that's why he's doing it. And I think it's great that he's doing that. But you're absolutely right. Central Intelligence, I was very pleasantly surprised by Central Intelligence myself. Um, all right. I we're getting we're running out of time here, and I said we'd run through a bunch of the Facebook questions as we can. So we I will thought you do were going to go through all of them, John. Every single one. Um, I will. I will month. read all of them. <laughs> I will read all of them later off air. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Cody Reed asks the first question. He asks, thoughts on the newest Star Trek trailer, the one just dropped today, including the music used. I'm stoked for the film. What did you think of the new trailer? I think it was a step down from the second trailer, but a better use of music than the first trailer. I think even though they decided to use a song um, that wasn't a musical score, um, they sabotaged and it didn't fit. Now, I don't necessarily think that this one fit. I still, it makes me nervous that Justin Lin, a former music director, is still using these music videos to sell mm-hmm. the movie. I don't, and, and what was scaring me was that they were selling the trailer on Rihanna's new song as opposed to saying, watch the trailer. Even the marketing email that went yes, out was, just, wasn't Rihanna's, just watch the new trailer. It was like, watch the new trailer featuring the new song from Rihanna. That was so, I, you know yeah. what? I'm sorry. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, shut up with, get that shit out of yeah. here. That is so stupid. Cause you know, I think this movie is going to be great. I did too, but, I'm, but, but it, it scares me the, the way they're marketing it. It scares it, me that they're doing they're, oh. they're, 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 these music videos for trailers and like, like I said, though, if you watch the actual song, it's not as distracting as Sabotage was. I think that it's actually more distracting that they promoted it with, hey, look at Rihanna's yeah. song. Rihanna's Rihanna, song. everybody, Rihanna. If Rihanna's song was no just one cares the Star Trek we care the about. the song was just in there and you didn't tell me that it was Rihanna's song and you weren't marketing it that it was Rihanna's song, I would probably, that would have been an interesting choice, but I don't think it would have bothered me as much. But knowing that they're marketing as like this music video, it was a little mm. more concerning. I haven't seen it yet. Um, ever since we talked about it this morning on, on Movie Talk and in the chat rooms, uh, just a lot of people are saying that having Rihanna singing in this trailer just seems so out of place and it made it seem like it was promoting her music more so than the movie itself. And it's kind of, for me, just reading that, I'm like, what makes me want to go out and watch this trailer then? Right. I'll just wait for the movie to come out and just go see that. Because I, I did like the, the last one that they dropped. Yeah, the last one was a lot mm-hmm. better. Uh, yeah, the second one was great. You but score. you don't need, yeah, they, that's right. Yes. That's what Star Trek is. And I'm not saying you can't in, in, you know, bring in new elements or whatever, but that first trailer sucked and yeah. everybody knew it and Paramount knew it. And then the second trailer came out, and everybody redeemed it. Yeah. And then they went back to, no, we got a pop Rihanna in there. It's like, give me a break. Um, okay, I'm having a hard time because so many of these questions are about Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay, Pedro Ordinez writes, do you believe the rumors that Marvel and Fox are in talks about working together the way Marvel and Sony are? No. Uh-uh. No, neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's really not much more yeah. to go beyond that. Yeah. Um, so because, just real quick to answer that is because Sony, Sony was in, in big trouble. When they made that deal. Yeah. Yes, yeah. massive trouble. Fox is in, is in no trouble at all. No. no. And they just had a big hit. Yeah. And even though I mean, they had a big, massive hit with uh, Deadpool, and even though there are mixed reactions to X-Men Apocalypse, it's made money. Yeah. So they're not in any trouble whatsoever. Um, 
What are your thoughts? Uh, this one's from uh, Tohidur Razak writes, what are your thoughts on The Legend of Tarzan? Have you been able to screen it yet? Do you know how good the movie is? I actually got invited to the premiere tonight. Too, oh, great. Okay. But I cannot go. Me too. Uh, oh. I, cannot, I cannot go to the premiere tonight, but thank you, Warner Brothers, for inviting <laughs> us. Uh, I'm actually going to go see it on Wednesday. Me too. Uh, really? Are you going to go <laughs> yeah. Wednesday night screening? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to see it on Wednesday night. Look, when they first announced the movie, I thought it was a dumb-sounding idea. I heard the cast. And I thought, okay, that's intriguing. The cast is intriguing. The, the trailer sold me. I know some people, like I have some friends of mine that hated the trailer. The trailer sold me. And I find myself going into Wednesday excited. I'm actually excited to see this movie. So I don't know, Wendy, what about you? Like, what are your expectations for Tarzan? I'm just trying to find the email where it says I'm embargoed. So I'm embargoed until the 29th. I actually saw it the other day with Dennis. I forgot about that. Yeah, that you saw it. So, so you can't even say what you thought of it. No, I can't because I'm embargoed until Wednesday. <laughs> okay. What about Christian? Since you have not seen it, your expectations of the film, are you looking forward to it? I was at, at the first trailer. And then I've actually heard from other people who have seen it that, that didn't really like it, and it wasn't Wendy, so Wendy didn't break embargo. Um, there was uh, there was the last TV spot that I saw that I'm, I'm made me a little worried. I was excited at one point, and I have I'm I don't I'm not expecting anything anymore, and I, I don't know if that's going to help my experience with it. But I've I have now come down to the place where I'm not expecting a great movie. All right, uh, I'll answer this one myself. This one comes from Brian Bolstein. Does Eric Lindros belong in the NHL Hall of Fame? Yes, he does. And anybody who says otherwise has an agenda. So, yes, Eric Lindros does belong in the Hall of Fame. Um, okay, this one comes from Ron Krenzowski, who writes, Why can't Hollywood come up with new franchises instead of digging up dead ones? Or try to remake movies? Independence Day comes to mind as well. Where do you think all these franchises come from? They all come from somebody starting a new franchise. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, have this, I have to say this all the time, but I'll continue saying it because people still don't get it. Yes, there are more remakes and sequels being made today than any other time in Hollywood history. But there are also more movies being made anytime. Do you know that there are also more original films being made now than any time in Hollywood history? Um, and like I said, like the, the new Jurassic Park franchise, where do you think that comes from? The, there's a Star Trek franchise going on based on the old one, but it got restarted in 2009. Uh, where do you think this, the Marvel MCU came from? They started with Marvel MCU movies, so we got a franchise for it. Every franchise we have today, uh, ride right along. Why do you think we have a ride along franchise? Because they started a new franchise. So all these franchises come from somewhere else. And yes, there are more sequels, reboots than ever before, but that's because there are more movies being made than ever before. And there are more original films to be made than ever before. I've done this exercise before where I've gone to the um, release schedule. So all right, I'm going to read off the next 30 films coming out. And usually I do that and usually 60, 70% are brand new original right. films. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way it is. But we hear Independence Day. It's we the market. hear it's yeah. the marketing, yeah. right? So we think that way. Anyway, how would you address some? I agree with you one hundred percent. I think that that's it's it's a matter of the marketing. So the reason why you are so aware of it is because the first one was so successful, or the second was successful, and they have mm-hmm. this marketing team that's going to make you very aware of the other one. So all these other franchises that are coming out, and there are big pushes during the summer for the franchise movies. So you're going to hear about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Part Two or the next Jason Bourne movie. And then the other ones, they're going to they're gonna take a shot at the original ones. And guess what? If those are successful, the next year you'll hear about, or two yeah. years, about part two of those. It's just, it's what happens. But there are, and I, and I, we said this on Mailbag a couple of weeks ago, there are a lot of original movies out there all of the time. Ex Machina. I mean, there's tons of movies out there that are original, but movies that sometimes a lot of people are not seeing original movies. Um, and that's the main thing. Great example of that right now. This, I, I get actually a little bit angry mm-hmm. when people are like, why isn't Hollywood doing more original movies? I get a little bit angry because like, you know what? I want to scream. Nice guys. I think, nice guys. Yeah. Yeah. They just put out a fantastic, original, fresh, wonderful, wonderful movie. And not it. everybody who complains that they don't do enough original films, none of y'all want to go see it. Right. So, I mean, that's the part that always frustrates me. It's like, no, Hollywood does. They put out tons of great original films and none of y'all go to see it. Because that same guy probably that wrote the email was, uh, Nice Guys was right next door and he was watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles (laughs) writing the email. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's, uh, I'll wrap it up with this um, because we are, we are approaching, uh, getting close to an hour here. So, uh, Brandon Hunt writes, Thoughts on what will happen with Doctor Strange? Will it be received well critically? Will it do well financially? Um, Honestly, for me, it's not about the cast. 
And it's not because it's Marvel. Because look, Marvel is is not batting a thousand. Like they put out Iron Man two. I mean, they, financially they are. Uh, yeah, financially they are absolutely. Yeah. But it's it's not like every movie they put out is a masterpiece. Thor two. I, I appreciated Thor two, but it's it was a, clearly a major step down yeah. from Thor one. A lot of people don't like that film at all. So it's not like they swing for fences. I personally, and it's not even because of the source material. I've got a lot of faith in this movie. Mostly because I think they got the perfect guy to direct this movie in Scott Derrickson. I don't think he's the best director in the world, but I think this was the right fit. I think this was the right match. And I think they're going to do something pretty spectacular. You know, a lot of people wondered and scratched their heads, and I was kind of one of them too, when they said Guardians of the Galaxy and when they said Ant-Man. I love both those movies because they ended up, all due respect to Edgar Wright, they ended up with a really good fit for the property they wanted to do. So me personally, how will it do financially? It's not going to make Guardians of the Galaxy numbers. This is a little bit more out there. This isn't fun sci-fi space opera. This is a little more weird. It's a little more strange. Yeah. And that's fine. That's fair. Disney doesn't need to make a billion dollars in every one of these movies. I think it'll do fine financially. But the bigger question is, how do I think it'll be received? I'm going to make a completely unfounded prediction, basing this on nothing but just pure speculation. I think this is going to be a very well-received movie. I don't know, Christian, what do you think? I think critically it's going to be a well-received movie. I think financially it's going to be one of the lower openings that Marvel sees. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because of I agree. exactly what you were saying. It's that it is a, it is, this is an acquired taste. This is, this, is some, this is not going to be for everybody, but this is also why I think Marvel is doing as well as they're doing right now because they're taking risks. They're changing up their genres. They're doing something that's it's not going to necessarily be a horror movie, but you saw that trailer, and it is a very odd film. It is a very a tone and it has to be for the source material and they know that and they've done that in the past with all their other properties and they stay true to it and they're going to do the same here it's another way for them to introduce Doctor Strange into their cinematic universe they will do that and hopefully they're going to reap the benefits from Doctor Strange 2 um, as long as they put together a, a solid film and I think that's going to happen I think it's going to do around 65 to 70 million this opening weekend Wendy how do you think it's going to do well first of all how do you think people are going to like it I think people will like it. That trailer really grabbed my attention right off the bat. And I think people are going to hold off seeing it maybe that opening weekend. That's why it's going to have that uh, financial dip because it's not your typical Marvel superhero movie with the, you know, the fighting and the pew pews. But, <laughs> the pew pews. But, but this movie just looks so cool. And uh, I, I do hope that it's going to, the trailer itself piqued enough interest to go have people go see it. So I think, Christian, how much did you say? Between 65 and 70. I'm going to go 85. I'm going to go – I'm going to split the difference between the two of you guys. I'm going to say 75. I think 75. But look, I think if they get $60 million on this, if you told anybody six, seven years ago, you're going to make a Doctor Strange movie. It's going to make $65 million opening weekend. I think people would have said you're crazy. Right. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to get 75, and I think they're going to be very, very yeah. happy with that. Yeah. Um, that's why they put it in November, by the way. Oh, it, yeah, point. yeah. Okay, guys, that'll do it for this installment of the John Campy Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. And don't forget, uh, help me out a great deal. If you open up iTunes, drop in there and rate and, and comment on this podcast. It'll help us out a great deal. Christian, you've got a million things going on. Where can people find you and how can people follow you online? Well, obviously, uh, Collider Movie Talk, five days a week. You can catch me on uh, Collider Jedi Council, Schmoes No. Um, but I also started my the Harloff Podcast where yes. I break down and I talk to people inside of this industry and just kind of get to know more about them personally and Mr. John Campia was one of my guests on that show. Make sure you check that out over on iTunes on the Schmoes No Show. Wendy, what about you? Where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, just at Wendy Lee Zaney. And uh, you guys can follow me, of course. Uh, first of all, you should be signing up and following my new show, Film HQ, over at Comic Con HQ. That's www.comic Con HQ. You can go sign up for free until Comic Con happens. It's not just our show, it's a bunch of other shows that have been launched on there that are so great. Mark Hamill is joining the family, of course. Uh, so go on over there. Uh, Nathan Fillion, who aforementioned, <sighs> him and Alan Tudyk have a show on our network. Make sure you guys go over there and check that out. And then, of course, you can follow me on social media simply on Facebook and Twitter at John Campia. So that'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of the John Campia Podcast. I want to thank uh, Christian and Wendy for being here, and thank you to you guys for listening, and until next time, bye-bye.